Hello world, my name is Mehmet Aydın Baytaş and this is Design Discipline where today we're going to talk about research through design. This is something that you may have heard of if you're involved in graduate school, like a master's or a PhD program in design, especially in interaction design or human-computer interaction, which is where I am from. Research through design is basically a way to materialize and express the knowledge and insights that you gain by doing hands-on design work. This is a discipline of research where you also have the opportunity to engage in the craft of design. So the appeal of research through design, if you're involved in some kind of academic studies, is pretty clear because it really allows you to engage with craft and creativity and all of the, like, the fun parts of design while you're doing all of your academic stuff. For design professionals, the value prop is a little more obscure, but actually research through design is very connected to like practical methodologies like design thinking and sprints and lean startup and a lot of other ideas and product management and innovation. So if you're involved in things like UX design or, or innovation or product management in your professional life, this is actually a super interesting area to look into. And the things that you will find here include extremely detailed case studies and like sophisticated discussions on things like um, UX design methods and speculative design. This is also a field where you might be able to publish your knowledge and experience if you're interested in getting all the credentials that comes with that. So regardless of whether you're a student or a seasoned practitioner, you have a lot to gain from understanding this topic. Now, this episode is going to be an introduction where we focus on purpose. What is the purpose for which we might want to do research through design? What was the reason why this idea of research through design came about in the first place? Why am I making all of these videos talking about research through design? We're going to answer all of these questions now and also look at some actual examples of research through design projects. First of all, I'd like to tell you why I am making this video and who is this for and what to expect. And if you'd like to skip all of that, you can find bookmarks in the description that will take you to the places that you want to go. So research through design is something that I have been doing for a while on a daily basis as a design researcher at the university. As I said, this is a genre of research where we get to do like hands-on design work and be creative. So I really enjoy that. But alongside my own research, I also supervise a lot of student projects. I review a lot of research papers and I have a lot of conversation with colleagues where uh, this, this research through design is a really central topic. When I'm doing these things, I encounter a lot of problems with regard to all of us being aligned in terms of like the mental models that we have of research through design, uh, as well as the ways in which we do it and then talk about it. Sometimes I actually feel like we all have a different idea of what it's supposed to be like. Because research through design is kind of a complicated topic and these problems of alignment and communication are inevitable when we are dealing with a subject that is so complex. But why is it complicated? Because research through design is an idea that has been developed primarily in academic literature. It's primarily among scholars at universities that this is known and practiced and discussed. Most of the explanations that you will find out there are going to be in research papers and academic books or in discussions with professors and graduate students. And the uh, traditions in these communities are that we should be rigorous and comprehensive when we explain and discuss things. We have to be making uh, contributions in terms of ideas all the time. That's kind of the expectation. Because of this, over the last 30 years or so, a lot of papers and uh, lectures and a couple of books have been produced about research through design, but these have mainly served to expand the topic by proposing new ideas, uh, to negotiate like what's good, or to present new examples and applications and case studies. But I think that now we are at a point in time when we can look back and try to clarify, to distill all of these ideas into a form that is uh, clear and legible. And the format that we have with the YouTube and the podcast and our website is actually perfect for this. So that is what we're going to begin to do in this episode. Today, we will talk about the origin and purpose of research through design, which means how and why it was like invented in the first place and how it is useful to answer particular kinds of questions and uh, challenges. 
I will also give you some examples of these things in action. In future episodes, we're going to return to things like uh, the methods that we use in research through design, how to evaluate and eventually develop a taste in this kind of work, uh, ways of documenting and presenting results using various deliverables, how to write and publish this kind of work in academic papers, and how to use all of this in actual practical or maybe commercial work. Ultimately, the purpose of all of this is for you to spend less time and have more clarity, more engagement, and more peace of mind as you do your own research through design, and also to communicate its value in a form that is legible to non-academic design-related professionals. So first order of business, what even is research through design and why does it even exist? Well, research through design is basically one of the three things that we might be talking about when we talk about design research. Now, we've already covered this in episode four of Design Discipline, as well as an earlier video on my personal YouTube channel. And actually, the popularity of that video led me to start Design Discipline. But anyway, so I will not explain everything again. You can always check out episode four if you like. But to summarize, uh, what we call design design research basically comes in three flavors. The first is research for design, which is a kind of information gathering that you would do before and during a design project in order to make good design decisions. The second one is research into design, which is, for example, when a historian or anthropologist might do research about how designers work. And before we move on to the third one, which is obviously research through design, Here's what you have to realize. If you're doing one of these two things, research for or into design, you're probably not doing design at the same time. In these cases, design and research are two separate activities, and this is actually very important. If you're doing research for design, you do the research first and then you do the design or sometimes someone else does the design based on the research that you've done. So think about like market research or what some people might call uh, need finding or discovery, which is something that you would do before you have any designs to begin with. If you're doing research into design, in most cases, someone else is doing the design and then you go and study what they are doing. So you might go to a design studio and spend time with designers and then write an article about how they work. This is actually some of what we do at Design Discipline. But what if you want to do design? What if you want to do a research project in which you actually create a product? Well, for this, you need research through design. With research through design, you set out to ask and address certain questions, which may or may not be about design, but then you're using design as a tool or method for this purpose. And this means that the research and the design are being done at the same time by the same person or the same team. Now, this is not a rule. There are exceptions to this, but uh, it's very important, this idea of design and research being done at the same time by the same person, because it brings brings us to why the idea of research through design came into being in the first place. This term, research through design, along with the ideas of research for and into design, has been coined by Professor Christopher Frayling in 1993. Christopher Frayling, a professor at the Royal College of Art, noticed at that point in our history that the various disciplines of art and design are becoming more and more a part of the university and of scientific research. And this is actually a modern phenomenon. It's something that's only been happening recently. To be clear, I'm not talking about education and design and craft here. That has been happening for ages. And we have, for example, uh, the Bauhaus from 1919 and the Industrial Design Program from 1934 at Carnegie Institute, today known as Carnegie Mellon University, which is still one of the best design schools in the world. But it is quite recently, maybe around the 1960s, that design is becoming to be uh, taken seriously as a research method. Now, the core problem that Frailing is trying to address here is that designers are demanding respect and recognition at universities, also known practically as degrees and jobs, which, if you think about it, are things that engineers and biologists and mathematicians and all these other people are actually able to have. But at this point, designers don't really have a tradition of research, which then leads to those things. But what does that mean? Like, what even is this thing that we call research? And how does that make a difference? Like, how is it different from a school that teaches design or having a history and like wisdom of craft, which design surely has? The short and rather blunt answer to this is that research means writing. A little more precisely and even more bluntly, research means articles written mainly in English 
reviewed and accepted by committees of mainly people with PhDs and published in these like journals, which are distributed mainly to universities. Now you might be thinking that is such a fucking narrow minded view. And indeed, this is the problem that we're attacking with the idea of research through design. You could make the argument that we don't even need all of these papers and journals or whatever because the creations of design themselves are so compelling. I mean, Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive did not get reviewed by professors or whatever when they invented the iPod. But regardless of the admiration that you and I might have for this kind of work and the actual impact and value of it in the real world, penetrating the academic establishment is a different ballgame. So research through design was meant to be a platform for designers to be accepted in these academic communities. Using this idea of research through design, designers could get jobs and prestige and funding to do academic research. Before we formulate the idea of research through design, if you wanted to do design research and have an academic job, uh, you had the option to belong in like the psychology department or the anthropology department. You could use their research Research methods, you could publish in their journals and still do work that serves to inform design. Some of the first research projects that deal with human computer interaction and user experience and the design of computer software were in fact done in this way. And we're going to talk about one of them pretty soon. If you really wanted to belong in a design department and publish research, a lot of that would involve analyzing design rather than doing your actual design work. So this would be mostly research into design. If you look into the earlier editions of some of the first design research journals like design studies and design issues, you will actually find a lot of this and also a lot of theoretical and philosophical work. But now, thanks to the idea of research through design, we are allowed to do design as part of a research project. Today, the majority of research projects that my grad students work on are actually done in this way. The actual research methodology that our students implement for their master's theses, for example, are based on things like design thinking or double diamond or lean startup. They're taking a process that is intended for creating new products or business innovations, and they're using that as a research method. And this is all thanks to Professor Frayling, who was a pioneer in explaining to the academic establishment that this should be a legitimate research method. For this and other contributions to art and design education, he was actually awarded a knighthood, so he is Sir Christopher Frayling, and that is impressive. Anyhow, now we understand why the genre of research through design exists, but the question remains, why would you actually do research through design? I mean, we said that we do it to like fit in the academic establishment and the format of academic research. So we do it as designers to conform to academia and the reward that we get is like jobs and degrees and grants. That is what you might call an extrinsic reason to do it, but we also need an intrinsic reason. So we need to like achieve something by actually doing research through design. This boils down to the kinds of questions that we can answer by doing research through design and certain things that are not always possible by doing other research methods. Now said questions are twofold and the first is about design itself. Specifically, it's about informing people who want to design effectively with particular materials or technologies that we don't really know how to handle yet. This doesn't have to be technical. It could also be about like the process or management of design. It could also be about how to engage with different stakeholders in situations that we don't really know how to deal with. So research through design allows us to engage with all of these new situations and uh, discover all kinds of like new insights and new questions, also known as unknown unknowns. And many of these things are actually only possible to discover by doing experiments, by actually building designs. The second kind of question is about people. How do people behave and think and feel in particular situations or when they engage with particular designs? What is it like to be that person in that situation or at a different level? How can we explain what we know about organizations and societies in order to navigate all of this better? Research through design allows you to deal with these questions by way of doing design. And this is kind of unique among other research methods because now uh, this allows us to see how things change when we intervene in the situation by inserting a new design into people's lives. A lot of research in social sciences also tells us about people, but many social scientists actually strive to like uh, observe how people and cultures exist and kind of like a uh, almost like a natural state. So they are concerned.
concerned with how things are, but research through design is concerned with the effect that we have on the world as designers. So this is about how things could or should or might be. A lot of engineering research is about how to deal with certain technologies and materials, but there, very often the impact of doing this on people's lives is not within the scope of their questions. So research through design allows us to translate the direct experience of building designs and interacting with them into scientific knowledge. Now to be clear, it's not exactly a scientific method. But research through design allows us to store design knowledge in the recording system of scientific literature, and that is f***ing amazing. Now we've been talking about a lot of ideas, a lot of theory and history, but now I would like to present three examples of research through design which illustrate some of the points that I was making. The first example I want to talk about is some of the projects that were being done at Xerox Corporation in the mid 80s. And there's actually a lot of research through design literature which discusses these projects. Xerox at the time was making photocopiers that were complicated to the extent that you might have to employ someone to take care of the machine if you bought one. You had to have like a printer technician, which meant that they could only sell to companies who could afford that. So they wanted to figure out how to design machines that everyone could use and expand their market, presumably to smaller businesses who couldn't really afford a technician. Xerox at the time had a lot of resources and this project involved a lot of interesting questions as well as a lot of business value. So they produced these innovative prototypes for these like user-friendly machines and they put them in actual offices where people were working to observe how they would use them. They employed anthropologists and psychologists and other kinds of like scientists who went on to analyze the impact of doing this. Now you might notice that this was done in the 80s, which is technically before this idea of research through design came about. Hence, a lot of this research was published in like cognitive science and psychology and anthropology, but the subject matter was also very relevant to technology and computers. So this actually became like a whole movement in computer science. You could say that this was the beginning of what we today call human computer interaction. I mean, technically this is what we call a second wave of HCI, but that's like a whole other episode. This project also involved pioneering work in interaction design and design systems. For example, they documented how they arrived at using the the color green to indicate where to insert paper and how to start the machine, uh, using blue to indicate where you're supposed to interact with paper. They use light colored plastic for parts of the machine that are touched and used often and dark plastic for parts that are perhaps reserved for experts. They developed a system for the graphics and instructions that appear on the machine and they created what we might call these uh, handbooks for designers and engineers from out of this work. This is really amazing early work in developing things like design systems, which digital product designers today are very familiar with. It's also the beginning of what we might call user experience design, and it shows uh, how a lot of the methods that we use for UX design today actually come from anthropology and psychology and other social sciences. The second example is a more recent one. This is from 2018, and this is a project called The Slow Game by Will Odom and his colleagues in Canada. Will is actually one of my favorite design researchers. He is a very good writer, and you can actually download a lot of his publications from his website, which is willodom.com. That's W-I-L-L-O-D-O-M.com. I can really recommend that you check out his work because he and his colleagues write with a level of legibility that's really hard to find in academic writing. So I enjoy it a lot, uh, but also the level of craftsmanship in their actual designs is really impressive. Like they are so committed to the craft of product design and industrial design that recently they have kind of uh, almost like invented a new idea or a new way of doing design research around some something that they call research products rather than research prototypes. Anyway, uh, that's super exciting. We'll cover some of that in future episodes and hopefully also have some of the people from their team as our guests. The example that I want to talk about from Will's work is called the slow game, as I said, and this is a cube 
made out of wood. It's pretty small, so maybe like half the size of a Rubik's Cube or maybe the size of a small apple that you can easily grab in the palm of your hand. Embedded inside the wooden surface on one of the sides is an array of LED lights. I think it's 8 by 8 so it has like a display with lights embedded under the wood which has like 8 pixels by 8 pixels resolution. This gadget is actually a snake game like you would have on the old Nokia phone. So there's a snake that moves around and grows by eating little pixels and you die if you crash into a wall, you all know the game. Uh, but the interesting things about this design is that uh, the snake actually moves only one pixel every 24 hours. So it's super slow and you control it by rotating the cube. The slowness in this project is not only regarding the interaction design but also in terms of how they produced this thing so they built this design from wood that they found in the forest after a storm and they had to work with it in very special ways to like stabilize the wood they did a lot of experiments to fit the electronics inside the wood in the end the research project tells us about how to design based on a philosophy of like slowness and calm and what it's like to actually live with these designs such as like the gray area between uh, calmness and uh, uh, maybe frustration if things start to take too long. I think that this project, along with other projects from Will and colleagues, are really quintessential research through design that you should check out. Finally, I want to give you an example from our own research. The project I want to talk about is called Drone Chi, and this was actually designed and engineered by my dear friend Joseph Ladelfa, who is still developing the project as part of his ongoing PhD. The idea in Drone Chi is based on a person moving together with a drone to perform like a meditative movement exercise similar to Tai Chi. We're talking about a very small drone that we use. It's maybe like 10 centimeters between the blades, so around the size of maybe uh, your wallet or something. And it's designed to look like a flower using custom 3D printed parts. It uses motion capture to detect the movements of your hands and your body and to fly the drone in like a really slow and precise way which responds to your movements. The main idea here is to push this technological material, the drone, which is usually associated with a jarring, uncomfortable experience because of its annoying sound and maybe it's watching you with a camera and so on but how to take that material and turn it into transform it into like a calm positive and almost therapeutic experience. I can tell you we learned so much about this technology and how to use it as a design material in the course of this project. We have published open source code and like guides for how to engineer applications with these drones as well as how we integrated like engineering design and philosophical inspirations on the level of design process management. We actually discovered that you can design with the sound of a drone which normally is one of the most annoying sounds in the world. It sounds like a mosquito but like super loud but we discovered that you can actually fly this in a way where uh, it's making a sound that people enjoy as part of like a meditative experience and now we are investigating how we might use this design in like healthcare for uh, like physical therapy for diagnosing like movement related issues or just as a fun exercise to do with your body so that is a preview of what you might expect from this genre called research through design. Just to recap the points, we talked about how the idea of research through design was proposed in the 90s to give a platform for designers to enter the academic community and enter the recording system of scientific literature. We talked about how research through design is useful to figure out how we can deal with materials, technologies, and like situations that are new, and also to learn about people and the world. This this makes it useful in practice because it tells us about our customers and materials and like management and it helps us figure out how to design and to um, understand the impact of our designs on the world in ways that only building the actual designs can tell us. Finally, we looked at three examples from industrial and academic work to see how this is actually done. As I said, this episode is only meant to be an introduction and we will publish future episodes where we dive into the methods we use and research through design, uh, how you can evaluate and eventually develop a taste in these things, and various kinds of like deliverables that we can use in this work and other ideas that you will be able to deploy in your own projects. Before we tune out, I know that it will take us a while to produce those episodes and you probably have deadlines. So for those of you who are doing research through design, I put together 
together a small reading list which will save you time. You can find this on our website at the end of the article that corresponds to this episode and the link is in the description. If you have any questions, comments, uh, critiques, demands or anything you want to say really, you can find us on the internet in various places. So go ahead and download and subscribe to our podcast on Spotify and Apple Podcasts where you can also give us a five-star review, like and subscribe on our YouTube channel, follow us on Twitter and Instagram as at Design Discipline and join the membership program on our website designdiscipline.com. I am Mehmet Aydan Baytash on Design Discipline. I really appreciate if you made it all the way to the end, and I'll see you next time.